So, do you want to get started? You want me to start? Yeah, well, I'll start. Um, so, um, hello everyone. Um, the goal of this presentation is to inform you on what we're doing in OSA, uh, but also pinpoint on how and where you could help. So, my name is Jean-Philippe. Uh, my IRC nickname is EVR Tab because it's going to be impossible to pronounce. Uh, I'm Mohammed. I'm Nasser on IRC. I'm the current PTL, and this is our previous PTL. <laughs> so, in this presentation, we'll answer the following question What is OSA? Who is it meant for? The community? Um, what did we do recently? But also, what are the plans for the future? So, our name is not really fancy. So, in OpenStack, you have like a guess game that you usually do. It's like, what does this project do? And, um, and well, we don't have the chance to do that, so I made you this. So on the left side, this is our mascot. It's OpenStack Ansible. Um, it installs uh, OpenStack with Ansible. And the specialty is we install it on containers or on bare metal. So, who is it meant for? We mainly have three classes of users. Um, the cloud operators, they use OSA to build a cloud for the users. They telemade it for the customers or their internal IT needs. Uh, we have people from ISP host, from ISPs, hosting, um, from retail companies. Um, Mohamed, for example, is uh, an example with, um, with Vexhost. Um, we have another category, which is the bring your own cloud product thing. Um, the companies are creating product to deploy OpenStack. I see people in here that create their product uh, around OpenStack Ansible. Um, so if you're looking for companies that bundle OpenStack Ansible, you can come tell us afterwards, after the presentation. Um, they most likely have a product for your use case. The last category is upstream developers. Whether you are building a new storage solution, working on upstream OpenStack code, um, well, OpenStack Ansible can help. We've built an environment to help upstream developers, like for Keystone, uh, for OPNFV developers, and the list can go on. It just depends on you. The important thing to keep in mind is that you're not alone in the deployment of, of OpenStack. And there are maybe more categories that we didn't think of, or we didn't think of, and you could tell us about it, because it, it's important for us to know. It's not the fight club. You can actually tell us about it. Um, so don't hesitate to help others by sharing your use case. That's how our community grows. And to talk about community, um, I would like to show you a few stats. Um, of com so, for example, the commits per cycle. Um, as you can see, I have no stats for Juno and Kilo, uh, but uh, Newton was uh, particularly big in terms of commits. Um, ONP was, uh, Okada and Pike was a little shorter cycle. Uh, Queens had um, refactoring and gating, so it had less patches. But Rocky started again with features and the um, projected uh, number of commits for Stein uh, should be around 2,000, which is 2,100 right now. So it means that anyone counts in, in that matter. So you shouldn't hesitate to propose patches. Um, in terms of diversity, um, I would say that for this graph, just um, it's about... Uh, uh, quantitative effort, right? Um, I, I'm showing, well, a lot of colors and things like that. It's very hard to read. But the, the thing you have to remember is for this exercise, I took the first eight companies in Stack Analytics and um, I put them in a table and I uh, and show these things per cycle in terms of commits. And so what you can see is uh, the colors and the size of the bar are changing, which means that companies come and go, 
And there are like more than 20 companies that made into the top eight top contributors in OSI in history. So it's up to you to come with your use case for your company and be part of this top eight. And, and you see that it's, it was a project that was mainly driven by Rackspace in the past. But you can see, for example, Vexos that is taking more room. Um, you can see independents that are, that are very important. You see 99Cloud that is, that is uh, ramping up, Red Hat, with new partnerships. And, well, um, Susie, thanks. And Susie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is, well, anyway, um, I'm working for Susie. He works for right. them, so he's trying not to brag, <laughs> but they all do a lot of work. <laughs> So um, um, for review diversity, um, as you can see, the, the trend is even more, um, I would say, the, the last line for, for Stein is um, the current state. So it means that it's not a projected state. Um, but you can see that when you check the, the size of the first three bars, um, it's, it's quite big. Um, and but we are reaching like 50, 60 percent of of reviews, which means that these three big groups are handling 60 percent of the reviews. So we are reaching a diversity there, and we are um, not a single vendor thing anymore. And I think it's very important for the future to continue in that direction. So. Sorry for more stats, but I think it's important. Um, so Stein is uh, not a projection again. Um, the amount of committers um, for Rocky has been uh, amazing. Thanks for everyone involved. We've broken the record of having 118, of, of having previously 115 committers, unique committers to move to 118. And I would love to see that trend going forward and, and increasing. That's, that's amazing. And the difference in terms of uh, calls um, is zero, which means no change. Uh, and that's sad for me. I consider that we should have always more calls. And we should, um, we should continue on, on getting people onboarded and, and, and have new contributors. So I will skim to that very briefly. It's the amount of uh, contributors on average. So we have about um, 15 people that are coming regularly every week. Um, there are about 25, 35 people that are active monthly. And uh, the trend is kind of going a little down. I would like to just make sure that we reverse that and being, having more people that are active on the longer run. And if they are more active, I would say weekly, um, well, there is high chance that they will become core and then it just continues, right? It's a, it's a virtuous circle. And again, more stats. <laughs> um, so um, the question for bugs is, are we piling them under our bed? And sadly, I would say that uh, recently we've been doing so because in Rocky, we've got less bugs reported and, uh, and the amount of pending bugs is increasing. And um, I would like to revert that trend by reinstating what, what I used to do in Okata and Pike, which was running, and Newton, which was running bug smashes. So during these bug smashes, we will uh, request help for the community. It will be uh, public on the mailing list. And um, it will be an opportunity for people to step in, know how these things can get, this problem can be solved, learn more about the project, but also have a way to know what would be the easiest way to fix something. So we'll mark bugs like low-hanging fruits, and this will help you um, help yourself, basically. Um, so um, for Rocky, um, we've been um, adding a new feature, a new series of features. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. So I can talk a bit about uh, what has happened in Rocky. Um, I'll try to get big, even though I'm, I'm already really loud. But so over Rocky, uh, we got a lot of help uh, from some of the newer contributors, uh, such as BBC, 
which is, has been very, very helpful. Uh, so the team with Jonathan uh, has helped add uh, Ubuntu Bionic support. So with their help, you actually can deploy o uh, OpenStack Rocky on Bionic. Uh, you know, if we have anyone from Canonical here, we'd love to talk to you about how you're doing releases. You would make our lives a bit easier if we coordinated a bit more, but uh, unfortunately, we can only start the integration of Rocky once the release of Rocky is out inside Canonical, inside from the Ubuntu side of things. So, um, but we actually managed to get that in uh, for the initial release, and I can vouch for some deployments that I've seen in production that is running it, and they're doing great. Um, we also added support for installation from distribution packages. So OpenStack Ansible's architecture has always been built from source and deploy these virtual environments. However, uh, there has been requests from several uh, different users that they wanted to deploy distribution packages. And so that's like deploying from RDO RPMs or deploying from the Ubuntu devs, uh, the Ubuntu Cloud Archive, or in SUSE's, uh, I guess they use RPMs as well. Yeah, so it, the idea is now you can actually use the packaging that your distribution provides to deploy OpenStack Ansible uh, as well. And uh, another thing that we did was we did a significant uh, reduction of the OpenStack, uh, of the amount of variables. So um, the variables that you can override, um, if there is a lot of them, the memory really starts kind of blowing up and Ansible really starts slowing down. Uh, this has helped actually uh, increase the speed of deployments, as well as some very tricky things that we found, like cruft from like five years ago that was slowing down our gate by like 25% and making it unstable. So that was amazing to find, and everything has been very smooth since. Uh, we've upgraded to Ansible 2.5, um, so we're trying to keep up with the latest. I think Ansible is at 2.7 now. I think so. We we'd like to kind of move up and and try to get to it, but um, I don't think that we'll be bumping major Ansible versions in Rocky at least at this point. It's probably best to leave it as is. Um, and we added uh, systemd and spawn, uh, which is actually really interesting. So the, we um, mo this is a I'm stealing I'm stealing Kevin Carter Cloudnell's joke here and is like if you're running Linux and you have systemd you have a container management software already and you didn't know about it uh, which is systemd and spawn so that's actually installed in all of the existing operating systems that we support so whether you're using uh, SUSE, uh, SUSE's uh, distribution whether you're using uh, Ubuntu or CentOS all of those actually include systemd and spawn so our idea was to rather than use LXC as our container or container platform, we wanted to switch to nspawn because moving forwards, that means that we don't have to pull in weird uh, dependencies from other places. We don't have to have issues trying to figure out some person that has backported patches to make LXC work on the CentOS kernels. And uh, so that will actually help unify and make everything easier, but it'll also make it much faster to deploy, much easier to manage, and it'll really tie in a lot better with the operating system. And uh, that, that should be uh, that is actually something that we're aiming to do. So we're aiming at working at making a transition uh, in an upgrade path. So moving forwards, you're only going to be deploying on top of Nspawn. Um, and there's uh, more to that as well. So we actually added a few more roles within that release. Uh, so Panko, Masakari, Congress, and Blazar. Um, so these are all uh, roles that have been added so you can actually deploy these projects using OpenStack Ansible. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of work done by new contributors in order to make this work, um, especially I know the, the folks behind the Blazar role were really <laughs> working a lot to make it happen, so awesome for them to do that. Um, inventory simplification and bring your own inventory. So if you've tinkled enough with the super deep things of OpenStack Ansible, you've realized that we have a dynamic inventory script that all kind of generates all these things automatically. And some people feel like it's very easy to use, and some might feel it's a bit more difficult and complicated. Um, and I guess we've, we've made some changes to allow you to really maybe not have to use that um, inventory file and bring your own one. And maybe you want to run a container with three services all running at the same uh, container or, or whatever use case you want to do. And now that's kind of possible. Um, we did a lot of role cleanup and simplification, so we actually had a lot of redundant repeated code across roles. Like, as part of all of our deploys, we have to drop in a systemd unit file, and doing that, like, 70 times across 70 roles, and every time you, like, need to bu fix a bug, you have to do, like, 70 commits for all of them. So we've actually replaced that with a common role, 
And so we added two of these roles. So config template is now something that we include as a role. And actually, it's been consumed by uh, Ceph Ansible as well. So it's cool to see our roles being consumed in other uh, projects. And the Ansible role, systemd, we have systemd mount, systemd uh, service, and a bunch of other stuff. And those allowed us to just do an include role inside of all of our roles. So if we want to fix something in the systemd stuff, it's one patch only, and it's, our life is not hell. Um, and then we also did uh, kind of a more distinct separation. So when we added distro installations, we wanted to make sure that both paths are very uh, separate and you kind of can easily toggle between source and distro. So we don't support switching from one to another, but by setting that one variable, you get that. And we still install uh, from source by default. For Stein, there's a lot going on. Um, and so first thing is updating Ansible. So we want to get on the latest release of Ansible. So we try to keep up with the latest one. So when the time for us to release, we're not like releasing with like a three-year-old version of, of, uh, of, of Ansible. And we're actually, uh, uh, John Rosser from the BBC has worked uh, with the project maintainer of Mitigen. So that's a project that does a lot of like really fast accelerated deployments. It's kind of an engine that somehow uses SSH in a different way. I'm really paraphrasing this, but the results are like we've tested some stuff in our CI and like the CentOS deployment that took like an hour and 20 minutes somehow took like 50 minutes instead. So it will really speed things up and will also help us remove some of the technical stuff that we have to maintain, such as our own connection plugins and more complex things and kind of maybe work with an external uh, library to, to do that. We added, uh, um, uh, intern, internationalization support, thanks to some work by uh, uh, the internalization, internationalization team. I should just say IATN. Yeah. That's why it's there for. Um, so we've actually had uh, co contributions to add uh, German translation to the OpStack Ansible documentation. And so if you want to help translate any of this, it's actually we're actually kind of the like the project that people are trying to see how they can translate documentation. So, you know, you can go and, and talk to the uh, team on how you can help uh, translate that if you want to do that. Um, Jesse, who I can see is like all the way out of the room because it's been so busy. Uh, he's been working a lot on helping refactor the code that we do to build our virtual environments. So he's kind of moving it more towards a just-in-time building of virtual environments rather than like a whole build process that happens way after. This is going to speed up deployments, make it much more stable, and make it much more sane to, to deal with. So it's going to like really, really simplify things a lot more, uh, which really ties into the repo build refactor. Um, we've increased stability for CentOS, so this was a long effort, but it involved things like working with upstream and adding mirrors, um, and so now CentOS is probably one of the more stable ways, and we, we worked with the RDO team to actually use their promoted packages, so we are actually testing with the latest packages of OpenStack, like master RPMs from RDO in order to test our distro installs, which is really, really exciting, um, and that's cool. And we've worked a lot with other teams. So the, temp, uh, the triple O team uh, is actually doing their own, has their own kind of Ansible role or puppet role that is kind of helping to do their CI. And we've realized that as uh, the triple O team was trying to get an Ansible role up to do Tempest, and we were like, hey, we're doing the same thing already. So we've actually started working efforts together. And so we've done uh, a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, there's a Red Hat, uh, well, a triple O tool called uh, Tempest Conf, which does some automatic detection of things to uh, get all the settings for Tempest in place. And that's all already included, like it's merged already. So hopefully we're, we're looking for more ways to cooperate as uh, triple O, as far as I know, is doing more of a transition to using Ansible to lay down configs and things like that. So I think there's a lot of potential in uh, gathering more contributors and working together with some of the triple O teams. Uh, to work on not uh, duplicating our efforts. And we've talked about cross-gating, so it, we had a really uh, good talk at the uh, summit. So what do we do beyond Stein? Well, hopefully I'll be around for that, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we want to improve our role testing. So the way that our role testing is done, we kind of have a way of doing role tests and another way of testing our integrated repo. We're actually trying to fix that during this cycle and make sure that we don't anymore break our integrated deployment by breaking something in one of the roles. 
And so this will increase our integration and make it a uh, far more stable product, which means that at any time if you deploy with Stack Ansible, it's gonna work, which is great. Uh, we've talked about doing things like promotions of roles. So if we make a change in a role, it has to be tested inside OpenStack Ansible. And then if that's valid, then we promote the, that role to kind of be the one that you're being used, which means you know your stuff is not gonna break magically uh, all the time. Better offline installs, so that's one of the efforts that uh, have been led a lot by uh, some kind of the, the Rax team, and they've been awesome at doing that. So uh, it's important for some of the environments where you know you don't have access to the internet very easily, and you might have to build all this stuff externally and then bring it over an internal server, point to that server, and do that deployment. So we want to do a lot of that and, and be able to support it. And then the community goal of Python 3 everywhere, um, I think that's going to be a bit of a challenge um, given that I do a lot of uh, the maintaining for the CentOS stuff, and CentOS like, hasn't hinted anything about what we're gonna do for Python 3, so <laughs> tough luck. We'll see what happens. Uh, thankfully, the other distros already have Python 3, so, but we're, we're hoping to be able to solve that and have Python 3 uh, everywhere um, all across. Are we good, good on time? Yeah, we're good. Good. How to give feedback. I want you to join us. Um, so I'm hosting a forum session about deployment tools and feedback for deployment tools. So whether you're using uh, OpenStack Ansible, Triple O, you're using the Chef, you're using Juju, whatever you're using, I thought it would be really good to all kind of be there and hear the operators and say, what is the common issues that you're seeing with deployment tools? So we want to hear them, what is the struggles? This is going to be really useful for us to take that feedback in. So when we take architectural decisions, we can say, hey, let's not piss off the entire world because we think this is the right thing to do because everyone doesn't like that decision. Um, we're also all around here uh, in the next few days. Um, I mean, you see us wearing our badges, so if you feel free to drag us down anytime. Um, it's, we're very all very uh, happy to talk to you about OpenStack Ansible, anyone in the core team or, or just the contributors. Um, we are on IRC, our channel is OpenStack-Ansible. Uh, the great thing about this channel, it's not a dev-only channel. If you have questions, um, if it is 3 a.m. and your OpenStack Ansible deployment has crashed, maybe someone in another time zone can help you, but it's definitely welcome to any support questions. So if you need to make any changes, you need help with some of the variables, or you're not sure how to do something, feel free to come on. And then uh, on the mailing lists, send whenever you need, uh, the tag that we use is OpenStack-Ansible. So just send an email with the subject OpenStack-Ansible, and hopefully one of us will be able to respond to you. How to contribute. So hopefully you're all really excited about this and everyone now wants to push a patch. Um, so we have a project onboarding that is happening, um, I believe, after lunch. So it is at level three, room one. That's what it says here. I'm, I'm trusting that uh, you put the right place. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, that's where we're going to be there. We're going to be helping everyone kind of get started. If you have some questions on how to contribute, if you have questions maybe as, even as an operator and like, hey, how do I get started with this? Or maybe you want to help with some of the documentation. Whatever you need, we'll, most of the core team will be there. A lot of our contributors and our operators will be there. So it'd be great to kind of share. And heads up, that's not going to be a session where I'm going to be here talking the whole time. It's going to really focus on uh, all talking together as a conversation all together and sharing what you need and some of the questions that you have. So uh, we'd love to kind of see everyone here there. And um, contributing doesn't have to be code, by the way. Sometimes it's review, sometimes it's bug triage, sometimes it's helping write documentation. So, you know, don't feel like, you know, it's a technical thing that's above me. Operators are actually one of the very most helpful people in, in this type of thing. Because sometimes we need someone to ask questions to and say, hey, as an operator, is this good or is this bad? And that is really, really helpful. So that's it. Um, I spoke a lot, as usual. And uh, we wanted to have some questions, if anyone had some questions about OPSEC Ansible or what's been going on in the few cycles or the future project plans. Uh, someone has a question. We just need one person to start, and everyone will start asking questions. Yay. So actually, we have been merging and backporting a lot of the uh, code to make it uh, and like make nspawn working um, in uh, Rocky. Um, I would say that if, when we add it right now, we are more in a stage where we call it experimental, as in like we probably don't feel comfortable stamping the production sign on it, but we also don't think it's like stuff that will break. It actually runs at a fair amount of scale. I saw Kevin earlier, and I believe he runs like some testing cloud that's running 50 nodes or 100 nodes using nspawn. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely somewhat battle tested, 
but we'd like to be more comfortable with more CI on it, more eyes on it to tell you, okay, now to go. I think the goal that we discussed in the PTG, and please correct me if I don't remember this, but in Rocky, and spawn is gonna be added as experimental. Uh, in Stein, I think we're gonna be really saying, okay, I don't know if we, did we say yeah. we're gonna do, yeah, well, CI is gonna be there, and I believe we were said that we're gonna actually have, try to aim to make it the default one. Uh, you could still deploy either or, but both will work. And then for LXC, we'll probably keep it around for a few releases just so that you know it gives you time to uh, switch out. But part of that is actually working on our upgrade jobs to make sure that the transition is as smooth as possible uh, and that we don't break your stuff as it upgrades. But we're really excited about it, uh, about in spawn. So, so actually, is James James Denton? Is he a, he's here? Yeah. So we have James Denton who actually wrote a book about OpenStack networking, and he actually has contributed a lot of drivers for these uh, for these uh, SDNs. So I believe we're actually we have Open Daylight support. We have. Uh, no, like actually in our in our CI gates, like it will test it. Yeah, and, th and and a lot of that goes to the work that's done in OpenNFE. So OpenNFE uses OpenStack Ansible to deploy its CI test environments. So a lot of that is implemented. So uh, OpenContrail, which I think now is, is Tungsten Fabric, that is also tested in CI and, and deployed. So, and I think there's a few, and Calico is also supported. And I might be missing one if someone remembers. I think there's four, I can't remember the fourth Open one. Flow? OpenFlow, I don't, I don't think I've seen OpenFlow. No. But, but the way that the roles are actually built, um, OpenStack Ansible deploys all these for you. But if you want to deploy that SDN, and all you need to know is override a few variables inside the Neutron config to point to the SDN, you could do that very easily. So you can do whatever you, tool you need to deploy OpenFlow, and then all you need to do is just change the Neutron config overrides to say, point towards this SDN, and OpenStack Ansible will do it. Well, the project that we just named are actually ones where OpenStack Ansible will actually help deploy the control plane for that as well. So that's kind of the difference. <coughs> I'm sorry? Um, it's, it's document, so these documentation are very specific, so they are in the role itself, um, but we intend to change that to move towards using user stories to explain um, from end to end how would you do with running SDN X or Y. Um, I think that there are um, some of the, those backend drivers, I would say, for Neutron, have specific tasks that needs to run, and those are uh, basically pluggable, and you can have, um, you can basically do a, a patch set if you want to improve and add your own solution. That's a really good question that we spend a lot of time on at uh, the, uh, at the last PTG. So what we actually had decided to do is we've actually backported a lot of the patches to be able to get you onto Rocky inside 16.04. Now, it's not the super cleanest of Rocky, but it's enough so that when you're on 16.04 plus Rocky, and this is for source deploys, right? And so you can be running Rocky on 16.04, and then at that stage, you would just you know, maybe kill off one of your controllers, rerun it using 18.04, like redeploy 18.04, and then just rerun the playbooks to get that up and running. Um, also, I believe that there has been some effort from some of the uh, Rackspace side of things. Is This is a big problem that they have to solve, and they're actually going to be working with Upstream in order to document a lot of these processes and how they're going to go about doing these upgrades and having some sort of Upstream process that people can follow, because that is a problem that we recognize, and uh, you're, you're not the only one that is that. So, um, so our networking doesn't actually touch that part, uh, we assume that the networking is already wired up, so thankfully we don't have to, <laughs> but <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> Absolutely no problem. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a process that we've done in the past, so if you were, if you were running older than, than Queens, then for example, you're running Juno, well, yeah. We, so you can do Juno in 14, so Juno, Kilo, Li um, Liberty, Mitaka, Newton, Newton, you switch to, to, to 16, and then Newton, Okada, Pike, Queens, uh, Rocky, then you move to 18. And so all of that is part of the code. So you can upgrade from Juno to, to Rocky if you want. 
And if anyone has support contracts with Canonical, please tell them to just like have a release behind. That'd be nice. <laughs> I, I saw another hand. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, so last time I tried that, uh, OpenStack Ansible has hooks, and ARA uses its hooks, and they were conflicting. So yeah. So, um, so basically, what we what we'll have in the latest branches is to uh, have an easy way to use ARA directly uh, inside the, the virtual env that is um, the virtual env that we use for for the OpenStack Ansible deployment. Um, w you can see it's already working, for example, in the gates of, uh, of OpenStack Ansible. You can check and you see the OpenStack infra uh, as already an ARA run. And, and we can, you can drill down into a different folder and you will see the ARA run of OpenStack Ansible. So it's already wor working with different ARA if you want. Yeah, you can. So just to... Uh Briefly show everyone, because I think I think this is really beneficial to make everyone's life uh, much easier. So just to kind of show off what uh, we're hearing from here. So this is a rule. Oh look, look at that! A patch to move ARA at the end of Bootstrap. See, <laughs> we're we someone already heard you and pushed up the patch. So you know we can we can look at uh, like this deployment here. Um, that's, that's the back port. <laughs> and so you can see like here we have an ARA report, and that's the whole uh, deployment that process that goes through and all the plays and tests are there. So uh, if you're stuck with anything like that, please feel free to let us know. The author of ARA, David, uh, lives in the same city that I live in. So we keep in touch often and he'd be more than happy to also help some of the users in, in making this uh, uh, fit nicely. But this is one of our very useful debugging tools that we use to, to debug the gate. Any other questions? What, until when does our talk finish? I think it was 40 minutes instead of 20, so we're good. So what time does it finish? 20. I mean, we have eight minutes. We have eight more minutes. Awesome. We have eight minutes of questions. I know everyone's hungry and wants to get lunch, but okay. I don't think they're serving lunch yet. <laughs> <laughs> good retention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, um, if Jesse was around, they'd be perfect yeah. to answer this. <laughs> so the, the the idea right now is you could have um, the repo server, um, which is where you basically pip install things or pip wheel build build the things. Um, currently, it requires internet, but we intend to have this part to be movable around. So it could definitely be something on the deployment node or. <laughs> so we just threw you under the bus. Um, We're about we had a question about offline installs. <coughs> and <laughs> artifacts, basically. App can you receive? Let's receive it. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, offline installs, it's been a journey. Uh, it's still on the way. Uh, OpenStack Ansible, from its very inception, was never built to be an offline installable thing. Uh, it does a lot of online fetching of keys, packages, uh, Git repos, all sorts of stuff. And uh, what I've been doing over the last few cycles is trying to just slim that down to something where you have a much smaller set of things you can easily just replicate. Um, so you can still build from source, but you would be able to do it in an offline manner. Um, it is possible to do it, but it's a lot of work. Um, to get all your mirrors in place. Well done. Um, yeah, in <laughs> fact, um, uh, to one of our core contributors, John Rasa from BBC Labs, uh, he does everything in a mostly offline manner. He's got a very strange security setup, so uh, he needs to do it that way. Um, but it, it's, it's complicated, and uh, I've been doing work over the last few cycles to try and reduce that complexity to make it simpler. Of course, another option is using the distribution installs. Those are uh, the distribution-based installs. Those are kind of mostly offline as well. Um, but uh, it'll be probably, at the moment, I'm working on just simplifying the way the Python builds work. That's my main target for this cycle. 
um, once that's done, we'll be able to follow that on, on actually targeting offline installs as being a thing um, that we can properly support. Yeah. So for the moment, I'm not focusing on offline installs, but it's an, on the horizon and it's something that's being th thought about as part of the set of requirements. So hopefully soon we'll have CDs like the AOL CDs for free and like install <laughs> install OpenStack Ansible on a CD. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. This is not, this is not the 90s. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a box for it. It's going to yeah. be great. Look, right. if that's of particular interest to you, uh, you can ping me online anytime. <clears throat> what is here for me? Uh, or you can catch me afterwards. Uh, I'd love more hands. So, and if you want to focus on that particular area, I'm happy to work together with someone to make that happen. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'm a little short-handed. So. <laughs> right. Thank you. I have one. Um, you take a question? I'm a little fuzzy about um, what's the difference between uh, picking a stable branch. Well, so why in the documentation when we uh, want to install Hotsa, uh, we are given a tag, uh, a value or commits? value instead of the stable branch because you know I mean I guess we all assume that bug fixers uh, add our bug filter to the stable branch right so yep. why picking the tag or why picking the commit log uh, so the idea is that um, well it was for operational purposes before that we were used to use um, SHAs in the documentation and we got these questions about people doing things and were forgetting to do to get the weird cha thing. So we, we got bug reports on, on, on that and it was not really conveniently readable uh, to say, well, uh, git checkout blah, which is uh, compared to git checkout with a, with a typed version. And so we regularly tag OpenStack Ansible uh, main repositories for all the branches um, so we do it around every two weeks. Um, <clears throat> those, um, those stable branches uh, are, have roles that are not tagged anymore, but um, we are uh, using role shards. Uh, so basically everything is set in stone so that when you are running uh, with a certain tag, you are expected to have a series of things that is well tested Gate tested, periodically tested, upgrade tested, and that is that is well known for everyone. And so, if you are starting to, if you want to redeploy that one year from now, it's going to be exactly the same code. It's not going to be a moving target. So, what is the latest So, if you want to use it's a stable, yeah, yeah it's it's. So, we recommend always to use the tag for a stable branch, because we back even if we backport things. Um, a backport could at some point be wrong between two tags, right? Uh, it, could, it could happen, even if it went through all of those extensive testing. Uh, yeah, so, so that's actually one of the things that we're kind of trying to improve. So in the stable branches, we fetch all of the stable other roles. because we're testing the next yeah. uh, proposed release. And so one of the things that kind of also happens is you know, we don't have a deliverable that is just our service only. We have a lot of external dependencies. We have to deploy RabbitMQ, we have to deploy Galera, and sometimes we've seen things like, you know, just a few weeks ago, RabbitMQ decided to change the URL where they store all their uh, signing keys, and, and that broke everything. So the idea is by having these tags is like, we can kind of say, okay, you might have checked out stable Rocky at a certain point in time, and then that stable rack at a certain point in time, uh, RabbitMQ broke something and we made a new release and it makes it really hard to identify like, okay, are you broken, are you not broken? If you give us a shot, we're like, okay, is this include the fix or not include the fix? Did you actually pull in all the roles? So it helps having like one kind of a unit of a release but we're actually trying to do part of the stuff that we talked about promoting SHAs, which could help us actually make it so that the stable branch is always valid, no matter what. You're never going to get pull a broken one. But you know, there's work doing. There's work needed to do that, and and we're trying our best to to help improve that. But for now, tags are the way to go. But for the long term, yeah. we're looking to make uh, branches. I, I would always recommend use a tag first, uh, and the tag may not work if there's a known issue. 
the, uh, which happens to be fixed. And only if the tag doesn't work would I then say, OK, use the head the of the branch. The idea of the, um, of the promoting is instead of waiting for two weeks to get something, um, the latest, I would say, yeah. freezed version of everything, we would do that on a more regular basis, even a daily basis. Um, because, well, we've got these kind of CI tested anyway. Um, but it's work in progress. So we're, we're, we're really trying to make OpenStack Constable like continuously deliverable. And right now there's these kind of few things that we need to iron out. Uh, and yeah, from roles to even the actual project themselves. So like our roles will pull in the latest stable Rocky or whatever. So if Nova broke something, then you're gonna, you're gonna be like, oh, it's not working. But in reality, Nova merged something that was broken. So by doing that, we're really, it's gonna be continuously deliverable. And uh, maybe someone will actually do continuously deliverable OpenStack uh, Ansible deploys. Someone. I know some people. Someone <laughs> might be working on it. I don't know. Uh, in fact, we do have someone doing that. Yeah, I know. I'm looking in the back. I think they're. Where's <laughs> Logan? So I think we're, we're probably running out of time. We can probably take one very quick question, unless everyone's very hungry. I think yesterday they ran out of food a bit early. So if you want to get some like hot lunches, go. Okay. <laughs> and uh, find us at the project at the project onboarding if you want to come for more questions.